60 exciting minutes. Uh, and uh, you've, you're joining the TNT show, The Nation Talks. Now, usually at this point in the proceedings, I have a rather uh, lame, crummy joke of some kind when I talk somewhat ironically about the uh, great deficiencies of, of British democracy. But I'm changing that tonight. Uh, and really what I want to say, and I think it's terribly important, because I suspect many of you watching and listening have been watching uh, Nicola Sturgeon and also Alex Salmond over the last number of days talking to the uh, Scottish Parliament Parliamentary Committee. And I want to say to you, regardless of how you feel about the individuals, this is a great day for Scottish democracy. And I'll tell you why. Where else in the world would you expect to see the two principles, if I can use that term, appearing for over 12 hours, not just answering the questions of the committee, which in itself would be fascinating and challenging, but also the whole activity is live and anybody anywhere in the world can tune in. I think that's a great tribute, frankly, to the substance and, and the incredible, incredible a focus of our uh, democracy here. I think it is, frankly, uh, the, almost the best way to, to shore up the institutions upon which we all depend if you want to live and prosper in a democracy. And I think it's a great tribute to all those involved, not just the two principals, but the people on the committee. I know many of you will have strong views one way or the other about some of the participation on the committee, but it's a symbol as well as an actual fact that you get to see the people who are engaged in public service right there in front of you, answering questions. Doesn't happen everywhere, believe me. Okay, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we have yet another great guest tonight and I'm really excited that he's able to join us. Tonight, the TNT show welcomes Stephen Gethins. Now, we will be talking about the crucial importance of Scotland's connection and clout, hopefully, with other nations. And so much more besides. I'm going to try and persuade him to talk about his new book, which will be published on the 17th of this month, St. Patrick's Day. And you need to look out for it. You really do. This is something very special. Seven absolutely excellent chapters. So we are taking your questions live along the way. Send us your questions. We'll try and answer as many as we can fit in. Please do. TNT, as you know, stands for The Nation Talks. And tonight, in many respects, as always, this is your show. Details for getting in touch with us are on the What's On Guide. Uh, if you consult with that, it will tell you how to send your questions to us. So please do so. Right, now to our guest. Tonight, The Nation Talks to Stephen Gethins. Stephen, how are you coping with the pandemic? Um, good evening. Um well, I'm coping just just fine. And actually, I'm, I'm going to just pick up on something you've just said, and then I'll talk about the pandemic. I spent four and a half years um, at Westminster when we struggled to get ministers to come up and answer. And I remember sitting on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and we managed to get Boris Johnson to come up in front of us twice or three times in his year and a half as Foreign Secretary. And, and, and to be fair to the First Minister, who spent hours in front of the committee today until the committee ran out of questions. Um, so I think you're right to highlight that. Whatever people think and the different views that they have, and that's fine, that's totally legitimate. I think that level of scrutiny is so important. And um, I think there's an awful lot that people at Westminster can learn, especially those members of the House of Lords who are uh, criticising Scotland for its lack of democratic accountability. But I'll, um, I'll, 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 I'll leave others to think about that one. No, I'm, I'm good. Um, this has been a really hard year for everybody, really hard, but I'm lucky. I've got, you know, I, um, I live rurally with two small children and um, when you've got two small children, you don't have an enormous social life or weekend life anyway. So we are in so much more of a fortunate position than so many other people. And actually you mentioned the book tonight and I think lockdown has given me the opportunity to be sitting in one space, not having a 10 hour commute as I did when I was in Westminster and in other jobs where I've been tra traveling um, a lot and to just sit in one space. And sometimes, and although this was forced and it's not in great circumstances, but just remaining in one place for, for a period of time, you've got to try and count your blessings where, 
where you can. So I've been, I've been very fortunate. And you've been busy. You have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. That takes up a lot yes. of time. Yes, so that's busy. It does. It's a lot of fun, but it takes up a lot of time and energy as well. But I'm, I'm really lucky. My wife has been exceptionally supportive um, throughout the years. And, and it's, no, no, we're really lucky. We've, 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 we've been lucky, but the wee ones are um, fantastic. But I have to say that I think that this has been a particularly difficult pe- period for children and young people as well, who have missed out on social interactions, missed out on school, um, missed out on all the normal stuff that, that that the rest of us enjoyed and took for granted. Um, and for me, it's been nice to be able to spend a bit more time with the children, but it's, it is a hard time for children and young people. And working at a university where the social element of university is so important for the students and they've given up so much over the past year. And I think sometimes we, we forget about that at times. Yeah, yeah, we interviewed uh, uh, a student from Glasgow University on the show uh, some months ago. And strikingly, that's pretty much what she said. It, it's the interaction that she misses. Yeah. And she felt terribly sorry for students who travelled to Glasgow from, say, China. Yeah. She said, you know, away from home, you know, looking forward to the whole Occidental experience and then finding themselves shut up in, in halls of residence yeah. and having to order from Just Eat or something and living on pizza. Well, it's hard. I mean, as somebody who I was able to participate in Erasmus and studied overseas, and it wasn't just – the studies were important, the different style of teaching was important, looking at things from a different perspective was important, but the social stuff and being living and working and interacting – in a different country is such an enriching experience when you're a student. And I remember coming back with the educational experience of um, a different education system. The perspective that I was given by having friends who came from other countries that, 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 that that gave me and the social element was so important. So yeah, I, I, I do feel because universities like St. Andrews and others are really international institutions. And as we'll talk about shortly, I, I'm a great believer in Scottish internationalism and your higher education and, and not, not just in higher education, but also in training and who you are as a country relies on that interaction and experience. Yeah, that's very important. We'll, you're right. You're right. We'll come on to that in a second. But let's learn a little bit about Stephen Gethins, please. I mean, yeah. Where, where did you? Where were you born and grew up? Uh, grew up, and how, what was your school like? What was your schooling like? Uh, and what, what were your first steps on the job ladder like? Um, so I I grew up in Perth, um, which is a great place to grow up. And I went to St John's and then Perth Academy. I was I really enjoyed it. Um, it was something that I'd I'd. You know, St. John's as a primary school was an absolutely tremendous um, primary school and Perth Academy I went to as well and had um, a good education and, and, and it was a great place to grow up. And it was there that I took an interest in the world around me. And after um, going to school, I, kinda, I went to university in Dundee where I did international law um, as, as, as well. And that kind of set me on the path of... A more international outlook. So I then subsequently went on to work in the international NGO sector, as well as in the European institutions as well. Um, but that really set me on my path. And one thing I did is I, I, I was involved in the SNP from quite a young age when I was about 17, joined in Perth, was active in the local party. But I also um, was, in, was in the youth theatre and got a job in the theatre there. And that was fantastic for giving me that little bit of confidence to be out there and express yourself a little bit, which I think is so important. Um, and, and it's so important that we give young people coming through the confidence to, to speak up, have an opinion. And it's okay if folk disagree with you. That's okay. As long as you can debate and discuss in a respectable and informed manner, that is the most important thing. So when you were travelling, uh, which NGO was it, by the way? You said you worked so in NGO. I worked for a while. I, was, I, I went off and I was based in Tbilisi for a while. Um, in in Georgia, and I was working on interethnic conflict there, and that was really interesting because Georgia was a newly emergent, newly independent 
country. When I say new, I mean, I was there 2001 through to about 2003, 4. And so it'd been independent for about 10, 15 years. So young. I had a lot of problems at the time. Um, the Russians had never quite got to grips with the fact that Georgia was independent and um, had stirred conflict, which had kicked off in South Ossetia and in Abkhazia as well. And I spent some time in the conflict that was blown up again in Nagorno-Karabakh. Yeah. And that's where you see, you see it firsthand, the impact that war has. You see it firsthand, the impact that bad governance and, and, and corruption can have. Um, and you also see that solidarity between states matters for something. You know, when the Russians are causing an embargo or they've, they've got troops in parts of your country, then solidarity with your neighbours becomes really important. But critically, trying to see somebody else's perspective is so important. Um, and, 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 and it showed me the... It showed me where political debate can go wrong and where political debate can go off the, the tracks because that's where you had a Soviet Union that kind of held things together. Um, but because it was almost, uh, because it was done in an autocratic way, as soon as it removed that, you had these dreadful conflicts that emerged. And, and the thing that when we watch these big geopolitical events happening is that we have to remember the human element of that. Um, and it was just really interesting trying to sit down. I sat down with members of the Russian military to try and get their perspective. You know, ministers, if you like, in these breakaway entities to try and get their perspective, as well as a country in Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan that were emerging from conflict. And I also spent a bit of time at that time working in the Western Balkans as, as, as well in the aftermath of the wars that raged there, um, in particular in Bosnia. And... What happened after that? What, what, was the, what was your route to becoming a, an MP? So after that, I went, I worked in Westminster um, for the group for a little bit of time for the SNP group. Um, and then I, I also went there and I went into the European institutions for a while, worked in the EU, worked inside the EU and worked in Scotland House. So I spent about four and a half years working in Brussels. And that was fantastic. Um, and I, look, and, and I say this as somebody, I've been a member of the SNP and pro-independence for as, as, as long as I can remember. But what was really interesting was going over there as a Scot in Brussels and trying to get a handle on, on Brussels. Um, and that was really interesting to see the way that other countries interacted and how much we had to learn from these other countries and the way that they interacted. And actually, what was really interesting over there were were two things. One is, and this is a bugbear of mine, when people talk about Scotland being small, and, 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 and members of the independence movement talk about Scotland as a small state, and I know I fall out, and I, I, I can remember hearing Alex Amden and Nicholas Sturgeon, both of whom worked with, using the term small state, and it used to drive me nuts, and I thought, it's not. In European terms, it's a medium-sized state, or some might call it a normal-sized state. Um, Scotland's a normal-sized country, and actually in international terms around the world, Scotland, in terms of its population sh share, sits bang in the middle um, around the world. So it was a really interesting bit of perspective, and you see countries like Slovenia, um, Denmark, Finland, and the way that they pull the levers and use the powers of being a state at a hard level, because you get powers within the treaties, but also at a soft level, you know, being able to show off your culture, being able to interact, being able to build networks and connections, that's such an important thing. And it's where you really see Europe coming together, but as a result of these states being independent and sovereign. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, 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 my own limited experience would, would support that 100%. I remember once I was doing some business in, uh, in Netherlands, and for some reason we ended up in Belgium and the nearest airport was Brussels. So I found myself on a Sabina flight to London with, uh, it felt like half the folks on board were Irish <laughs> who were doing a sort of one-stop trip back to Dublin. And uh, I, it was just, it took my breath away. These were young people who were managing projects who had power and they loved it. And, yes. uh, and it, was, it was evident that that power uh, 
that they had was what they would have had back home, but multiplied 10 or 100 times. It is. And, and actually, it's something, if you go into the front page of the Irish Foreign Ministry, it says that their independence is strengthened due to the due to being a member of the EU, it strengthens their sovereignty. And actually, it's a really interesting case if you speak to the Baltic states who have won their independence and take a really similar approach to that, that by pulling together and sharing your sovereignty, that, that, that you strengthen your own independence. And the Irish have been phenomenally good. And, and, and there's a really interesting thing when you talk about the young people going to and fro. Um, it is seen, I can remember when I spent four and a half years in Brussels, and I can remember speaking to UK officials in, in, in the embassy there. And London very much saw officials going to Brussels as time out. Whereas the Irish saw it, if, if, if you wanted to progress your career, a number of Irish officials would tell me it is essential that you spend some time in Brussels as part of your career. It's seen as something that is good for your career progression because you, you come to Brussels, you spend a couple of years there, and then you go home with skills, experiences, outlooks and networks that you would not otherwise have. And I thought, what a refreshing outlook that that international experience is expected rather than frowned upon. Yeah. And what's noteworthy too is I suspect some of these folks will go on, once they've finished their uh, career in public service, uh, to working for corporations in Ireland or elsewhere, and they will bring mm. all that uh, facility with them. They'll take that with them and bring it to their new employers. And sort of everyone benefits from that, frankly, it seems to me. Uh, and there's yes. almost no downside to that. Yeah. No, no, there just isn't. And the Irish are really good at this. You can never stop young people and others from going out into the world and having experiences and building up skills. And I can remember the Irish have got a really interesting approach with their diaspora, whereby they'll try and they'll they will try and help people to do it. You know, so one of the approaches is the island doesn't leave you, and you leave the island if you like. Um, and there's always the support networks, and and it makes infinite sense because. They're young people who are going to go and have these experiences. And then if in due course, and this is the, the way their life goes, they're ready to settle down at some point, then by the time they're ready to come home and settle down, if that's what they choose to do, they come back with networks, skills and experiences that they would just never have. Yeah. Um, and and, and I, I think seeing that cultural shift and the positivity around that is something that should be embraced. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, sticking with Ireland for a second, I, I was always impressed by the uh, uh, what seemed to me was a, a almost natural ability, <laughs> and almost a native ability to, to turn things around, uh, thinking on one's feet, for example. I remember once I was doing some business in Dublin and I was flying back and forth and uh, I used to get the bus from the airport into the centre of town. And uh, I, so I got to know the driver. Uh, the service I used, it was almost always empty. And the reason I got to know the driver, because very often it was just he and I in this big bus, and he would drop me off and we'd have a chat. We'd talk about family, blah, blah, blah. And uh, on one occasion, we were joined by this other guy uh, in a suit. And uh, fascinating. And this guy said, so how, how, how are you doing? He says, oh, I'm doing very well. So he, he's, the driver sounded very curt. Uh, and uh, and the, the question, the, 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 the passenger then said, look, uh, how's the service going? Oh, this is fantastic. He says, this is an exception. Most of the time, this bus at this time is absolutely crammed full. There must be some problem at the airport. <laughs> so eventually this other passenger got off and he turned to me and said, that was the Minister of Transport, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He said, I hate to think they cancelled the service. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it, interesting the way these things sometimes work out. And I guess the other place where uh, uh, the Irish influence is very strong would be, uh, and where I, gu I guess some folks would like to spend some time uh, from Dublin if they had to move in public service, would be Washington, D.C. Yes. And it's because been really interesting to look at the... Sorry, John, please. No, no, I'm just saying it. So I always find it fascinating when I was in the States to see how much influence the, the Irish community had on American politics. So it's really interesting. There was an Economist article written recently 
which described the Irish as a foreign policy superpower. And throughout the Brexit process, you could see that for the first time in its history, Dublin had more clout in foreign policy circles than London did. And that's yeah. really interesting. Um, because the moment that the UK left the EU, for example, the EU was interested in showing up and protecting its members. So Ireland was still a member, the UK isn't. And so Ireland has a seat at the table, the UK and Scotland as part of that at the moment doesn't. And so you could see that there was Ireland sitting with the foreign policy clout of being a member of the European Union and having a seat at the table. And similarly, they've done really well in the United States. Over, remember, this has been hard work. It's soft work over years and years. But to this day, the Irish are the Irish head of government is the only head of government anywhere in the world who is guaranteed an annual meeting with the president of the United States, which happens on St. Patrick's Day every right. year. The Irish Taoiseach turn up. I think this year might be the, the only one, the first time they're not doing it. But I'm sure that Joe Biden, who talks about his Irish roots regularly, seems to be very proud of them, um, rightly so. Um, I'm sure they'll manage to have a, a Zoom or a Teams or some kind of meeting. So they'll have a virtual meeting. And that's so powerful. And I noticed that during the Brexit process, there's little Ireland, well, I say a little, not so little, slightly smaller than Scotland, who not only had the EU that had their back, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Poland. But you also had, the, in the United States, you had Nancy Pelosi saying, we will not back a, a UK-US trade deal that undermines a Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. That was Irish diplomacy at work. Yeah. Um, and then you've got the political clout of the diaspora who, um, who sit within the States. And actually, it's very similar to the political clout that the Scottish diaspora has got from some of the experiences that I've had with them over there. But, it, but the problem with the Scottish diaspora is you do not have a foreign ministry to hang your efforts on. That's interesting, because one of the questions we've just been asked by Sharon Gallagher is, should the SNP better engage with the Scottish diaspora to help build an international support for an independent Scotland? So... It's a really good question from Sharon. So that's on the politics of it. Um, so can I answer this one in a sort of broader sense, if, if you like? Um, first of all, on the, the Irish, although they've got this powerful diaspora network, they're reasonably light touch because Ireland's about 5 million. The diaspora is about 78 million. Scotland's got about the same numbers. So it is impossible because you don't have enough officials, you don't have enough of an infrastructure to have such a big diaspora. Now, your diaspora is a really positive thing. In Scotland and Ireland are lucky to have such a widespread diaspora with, with, with such clout. But I think you always have to be mindful about what, what you do. Another point is I'm not entirely convinced we should be asking the diaspora to be involved in the independence movement. The reason being that... Independence is about people who live in Scotland, who make Scotland their home. Now, that's not here that diaspora is, is, is important. It is. And the author and broadcaster, Neil Asherson, spoke to me about this. And he said, I remember him saying to me, you know, and it's in the book, he says, the diaspora is politically quite useless. I, he, he didn't say it badly, but it was just in, in, in a sense. But as in, I think it's politically quite useless to discuss. Now, now he also paraphrased in his book about the Black Sea, I think Nicky Fairbairn, the old um, Tory MP for Perth, Inc. and Ross, talked about how um, any Greek Tasmanian or the bastard child of an American who decided to live in Scotland could decide on Scottish politics rather than somebody who had true Scottish blood but didn't live there. But, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with that. The whole idea of independence and having a civic approach is that it doesn't matter if you're a Greek Tasmanian or the bastard child of an American, that Scotland is your home and you're just as Scottish as anybody else's. And I think that's really important. And it was really important in the aftermath of the Brexit referendum. Um, and I've heard people like Michael Gove, George Galloway and others talking about giving people who live outside Scotland the vote in any future independence referendum. Well, how do you decide that? Do you give it to people based on the basis of blood, 
blood and ethnicity, which is something which I feel distinctly uncomfortable with. So the answer is, I think we should be engaging with them. And you can lay the foundations, but I think the decisions in the debate has to be one of people in Scotland. So if you're a Scot and you're living in London or New York, I say good luck to you and it's great and stay in touch as a um, and stay in touch as a as as a part of your diaspora. But if you're a family who've just arrived, say, from Poland but are committed to Scotland, then of course you should have a vote and you have a say um, in in how in 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 going forward. Where there is also a benefit is the moment that you achieve independence, you have a network of goodwill, culturally, socially, business-wise, and you have diplomatic clout, the likes of which other independent countries never had. And it was really interesting looking at countries like Armenia, the Baltic States, Ireland, Italy, Israel, Ethiopia, and the way that they and others have used their diaspora networks um, at the time of independence. So it's a long answer. Apologies to Sharon. It was a long answer, but I thought it merited it. Okay. So so, since you were good enough to give us a fulsome answer there, I'm going to ask you a question that uh, you might want to dodge uh, because you you have now, uh, um, you've begun a new career. But this is an inevitable question that crops up when talented people on the show. Uh, Stephen Kelly asks, uh, when will Stephen stand again? (laughs) His talent is lost to us. <laughs> That's very nice of you to say. Um, you can be politically engaged to not be in elected politics. Um, and it's nice as I want to say. But look, I think the thing is, I've, I love my job at the University of St. Andrews. It's a, a great job. I'm lucky to have it. And I'm really enjoying it. But I'm still utterly committed to independence and I, I I won't rule out not standing again but there's plenty of work to be done I've got a cracking job at the moment which I'm I'm enjoying and also the thing is things are going to move pretty quickly so I'm sure there might be plenty of campaigns coming up that we can all get involved in um, and as much as I miss elected politics there is more to life than elected politics. Yeah. Maybe what Stephen's reflecting Stephen is that there are MSPs who are also professors. Uh, maybe yes, that's there not are. going to be the case there are. Uh, in the future. But uh, so, you know, it is possible, I guess, to do both things. Uh, but, but I take your point. I mean, you know, it's, 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 you, you've, you've got a big job at home and you've got a big job uh, academically. Uh, it's, it's hard to fit in a great deal else beside that. Because I guess if you're going to be an elected representative, yeah. then you have to be there for people. And uh, if people's Look, I'll, I'll say working. this. Yeah, I mean, when I was an MP, so I'll, I'll say this first because I say this with respect to the outstanding team in North East Fife. When I lost in December 2019, our vote went up dramatically. It went up about six or seven thousand votes, about eight or nine percent. It was a, th- it was the second best vote the SNP had ever had. I think just, I think it was joint, almost the best result we'd ever had in terms of numbers of votes. Um, but we're lost. But I have to say that those periods, it was an utter privilege to do that job. And I loved it. But it was very hard family wise. You know, and I it's the thing that when you're commuting down to London and I know from other colleagues um, down there, it's hard on families. It's 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 a hard job. Um, and I have to say, my, um, I don't think there's one SNP MP who is not desperate to get home for a good. So um it's, it is a privilege, an absolute privilege to do. Um, and I was lucky to, that, 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 that so many people um, helped and it all do with having a good local campaigning organisation. Um, but it's hard. That's a long commute down to London. Yeah. 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 And then you've got to find a place to live down there and you've got all this sort of housekeeping type of business as well. I mean, I'm not sure everyone fully understands uh, what an enormous degree of disruption is involved in being an MP, uh, e- even, if yeah. you don't, if you, even if you don't have a family here. Yeah, and ex- exactly. And actually, during the Brexit years, we never knew when we were going to be getting home. Now, we signed up to it, so no complaints from that. We signed up, we knew what we were getting yeah. into. But I can say now with a bit of reflection, if you never, ever know when you're getting home, it puts a huge amount of pressure on your family. It also means the stuff that I loved doing was I loved getting out and about around the constituency, speaking to people, chatting to them. I was noting a significant shift from no to yes. 
um, during that period with everything that was going on, not least in North East Fife. Um, and also when I was speaking to people who grew up around Perthshire, I was noticing that shift. But I wasn't able to do as much local stuff as I wanted to because you were you were stuck down there. Um, and because the, the government sits on the order paper, you are, um, you're sort of beholden to whatever the government do. So, you know, I can remember there were nights day after day when you didn't know whether or not you're going to be getting home at the end of the day or not. Now, we signed up to that, no complaints. But after a few years, it's, you, you start to notice the pressure on people. Quick question about that election result that, that mm-hmm. resulted in, in, in the, the way it did. You added lots of extra votes, uh, but nonetheless, you didn't win. Was that because, I mean, mm-hmm. it, what I find astonishing is uh, knowing your quality, that you were replaced by a Lib Dem. <laughs> and, you know, no disrespect to, to, to the present MP intended here, but uh, I, I do detect a, a gap. Uh, I, I won't put it any stronger than that. Uh, it, so it's, looking at it from a distance, it, 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 it looks very odd that, that you're no longer there and some, you've been replaced. I mean, what, 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 was there some sort of a, a voting transfer between one party and another? So, yeah, the Tory vote collapsed. Out of all 650 seats in the UK, there was a bigger drop in the Tory vote in North East Fife than any other constituency, the length and breadth of the UK. Um, and we put our vote up significantly. So you had people who were pro-Brexit voting Lib Dem and others. And I say that with no disrespect. You know, every party has to fight their own campaign. And if you're looking for fairness at work, then politics is the wrong job for you, quite frankly. <laughs> so, you know, it's... Uh, um, um, yet it's... You have to remember, and, and it's one thing I reminded people when, if ever you start to feel, you know, make the most of it when you're doing it, because it could all be over in a flash, and you just have to do your best when you're there, um, and and try and do your best, and try and respect your opponents, and get on with your opponents. Um, I actually think that's a much more effective way of making your case, and building the case for independence. It just makes life a bit more pleasant as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I keep, you know, we interview a number of people on this show who uh, are not in the independent silo. They belong to a different silo. Uh, and the reason we do that is because we feel it's terribly important to talk to people who have a different viewpoint for two reasons. One yes. is, if you don't, you run the risk of you're preaching to the choir. And that seems a bit pointless. Yes. Uh, and also, frankly, uh, in my humble opinion, based on the 50 shows we've done, a lot of people are on a journey. They they were somewhere else. They're now moving to a different place. They don't feel terribly confident in many cases about that journey. And it seems to me we ought to be in the business of making that trip a little bit easier for folks rather than saying to them, what a pity you started where you started from. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think if, if you believe in independence, we should be as welcoming as we possibly can be. If the, in any future referendum, there's no point in getting 45%. You need, you need to welcome more people. You know, there's no point in getting 45% again. Um, so it's important. And actually, I think, John, you've, you've, you've just touched on something really important, and that's the need to understand people. And there's this divergence where we don't understand each other. And actually, with, I've got friends and family down south and all they hear about the SNP is how dreadful we are. And I'm sure there's plenty of scope for criticism. I'm not saying there's not. But when you do not understand what is going on in Scotland, then that creates a polarisation. And it's one of the reasons why I think those who believe in the union are losing the argument at the moment, because you're sort of sitting, and if you describe the Scottish Parliament as a banana republic, um, what you're doing is undermining the institutions that people believe in. And if the politicians, and it's... It, it, and, and, and I think that lack of understanding is a mistake that we cannot, those, those of us who are pro-independence cannot afford to make that mistake. And do remember that for some people changing their mind, it's a big deal. It's a big personal thing for them. And it's a big journey. And I think we need to be responsible to help them on that journey, obviously. But let people take their time. I can remember when I was going around the doors, tapping thousands of doors. And there were some doors you just, 
leave people with a thought and then you'd go back a few months later and you'd maybe talk to the same person and the ideas that, that, that you the seed that you'd planted had maybe evolved a little bit people had thought about things in a different in a different way and sometimes we just need to be able to give people that little bit of space to make up their own mind and interrogate their own and this is something we all need to do interrogate their own beliefs as well because we don't get everything right and we need to reflect on that yeah i think that's a very good point Stephen, let's talk about your book because i'm very yeah. excited about this book uh, i'm going to rush out and buy a copy as soon as i can did, did you bring a copy of the cover with you are you allowed to show people the cover I can. Hold on. Um, no, you don't have to go away. Like, I, I, I've, got, oh, no. I've got one with me here, which I'm going to hold up. Uh, that, that's the book. Please book. do. Now, the, the nation, you see, it, I'm reading it. Upside. It's Nation to Nation. This is the book yeah. that you want to head out yes. uh, to whatever mechanism you use nowadays to get books. Uh, and it, it's by Stephen Gethins. It's available from Lua uh, Publishers in Edinburgh. And uh, I don't know what the price is. You tell us what the price is, will you? It is. I think it's twelve ninety nine. I tweeted out the link. It's such okay. a shame. I think it's twelve ninety nine if you buy it online. Um, and if if I'm able to physically get out there and sell it, I'll I'll, I'll be able to sell hard copies in meetings coming near you if we're allowed. <laughs> so um, I think that's the online but price. Fa- fa- if you feeling that uh, St Patrick's Day, seventeenth of March. This book is going to be available. Uh, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your friends and family, uh, frankly, to get a copy of this. Let me, let, let, let's me let give uh, Stephen uh, an opportunity to ask why the seven chapters in this book will make a difference to people's lives. So, all my life, as somebody who's been interested in foreign affairs and worked in foreign affairs, and somebody who believes in independence, I've often thought about Scotland's foreign policy. And... A lot of people will suggest Scotland doesn't. How can Scotland have a foreign policy if it's not an independent country? So, first of all, I wanted to nail that on the head. So what I wanted to do was show that historically we've had a foreign policy footprint going right back to the mists of time, you know, and um, going right back to the mists of time, Scotland has had foreign policy throughout the years and that has evolved. In the same way with other countries, its foreign policy has evolved and our relationships have come and gone throughout the years and that impacts on us. So once I'd established that we had a foreign policy in the past and looked at what we're doing with it in the present, so I looked at how does Scottish Parliament use its powers, what's our brand like, the diaspora, how's Brexit having an an impact, what's our relationship like with our neighbours. I then started to try and form ideas in my head, what might it look like in the future? And actually, I I got really struck. So I, I held a series of interviews with politicians from elsewhere around the world um, about what they thought. Um, to, it was good to get their perspective with diplomats, with academics, with journalists, stakeholders, and actually, crucially, with politicians from across the political spectrum. So as both surviving Labour first ministers, um, Conservative government ministers, as well as you know Scottish government ministers as well. Um, and I wanted to get a good perspective because I thought, well, if you're going to be independent... You need to, you really need to, the the world will be taking an interest. They might not have a say, but they'll be taking an interest. And I remember Malcolm Chalmers, who is a professor at the University of Bradford and the deputy director of RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute. And Malcolm Chalmers is is a unionist, very thoughtful unionist, but he says, I believe in the union. And he made a really interesting observation. He said to me, I'll be voting no and campaigning against independence. That's fine. But what he said to me was, he said, but if Scotland's independent, I want Scotland to be successful. If, if, if you're successful, Stephen, and I'm not, which is, that's, a, that's the stuff of politics, I want you to be independent because it's my country as well. And he, he said something really interesting. He said, remember, with foreign policy, the decisions and how you're perceived in the world on day one of independence and in the early days will, be, will have an impact for decades to come. You can't get those first impressions of you like back again. And that made me think, well, we need to be ready for day one. And the way to make um, us ready for day one is I've set out the book. My hope is that people will engage with it. Some of them will read it and think it's absolute tosh and they'll set out an alternative perspective. That's fine. Others will take some of the ideas that I put in them and run with them. And that's fine as well. 
But for me, it's about getting a debate and discussion started and about broadening out that debate about what kind of country we want to be. Because whereas in 2014, our, our role in the world wasn't so big, Brexit has meant that with the divergence between an embracing of multilateralism with independence or unilateralism if you stay within the union, because that, that's, that's what Brexit is, the choice, there are a lot of choices you need to make around independence, but a big one is what kind of country do you want to be in the world? Where do you see yourself in the community of nations? And I think that's a debate and discussion that we need to have. And I hope that this book will contribute to that debate and discussion. Good, good. Uh, tell us about, in particular, about some of the uh, later chapters. Because, uh, I, I mean, I just found it fascinating. Uh, you, you talk about uh, uh, the High North. Yeah. Now, I know others have talked about the High North, but, but, but you, you treat it slightly differently. You, 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 make, you make the point that the First Minister spoke recently at the uh, Arctic Circle Assembly. Yeah. But for a lot of people, I mean, we've had 300 years of looking south. So it sounds like counterintuitive to talk about, hey, there's something happening in the north. So, so you, 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 you're absolutely bang on there. Now, my old geography teacher at Perth Academy was a guy called Mr. McLean. I remember him first year. He said to us, remember, there is no right way up and no right way to look at a globe. And, and you're, you're right, John, because we often think about our neighbours as being... Belgium, France, etc., which which is fine. They are the close neighbours. Actually, we have long borders with. We've got a border with Ireland, with the Faroe Islands, with Norway, with Denmark. So these countries have been really important throughout the years. You know, for goodness' sake, we had common citizenship with Denmark and Norway for a number of years, and. And, those really, and, and actually, I was speaking to Marriott Leslie, who's a former British ambassador to Oslo, and she was saying things. Remember, the Norwegians see Scotland as quite special. They see you as special neighbours. It's a special relationship for them. And it also struck me that um, within a European context, Denmark, Sweden, Finland all cooperate quite closely together. And I was speaking to Irish members of parliament, and the Irish members of parliament were saying really interesting things about, well, Scotland can help us connect with the Nordics. And there's something called a new Hanseatic League emerged of partnerships, which is the Baltic states, the Nordic states, the Netherlands and Ireland, um, who have started working quite closely together. And this is where our history informs our future. The first thing that William Wallace did after the Battle of Stirling Bridge is, and we know this because the only surviving letter that survives of William Wallace is the letter of Lubeck. And that was a letter to the Hanseatic League of its day saying Scotland is open for business. So this is a relationship that's been there and these are our natural allies and partners. It's not to say that the rest of the UK will, will not continue to be important. It will be. But when you're independent, you take a slightly different view and bluntly you take a look at the globe slightly differently as well. And there's also quite a lot that we can learn from these countries, but take a different look at the globe and take a different perspective on how we fit into the world and where our borders are. Yeah, well, that's very, very good. I think some of the people watching and listening will be uh, slightly troubled as I am, uh, but, uh, but you address this point. What they'll be thinking of is, how can you have a foreign policy when you're not a sovereign state? Yeah. You address this in chapter three. Uh, Scotland, a foreign policy player without a foreign policy. How can you do that? So the Scottish government, so I, I, you know, let's go further back. This has existed before devolution. So if you look at the, the devolved parliament has always had an external affairs policy. And I spoke to Jack McConnell, Henry McLeish, who had some ambitions, albeit more limited ambitions, but they had ambitions in terms of international development, yeah. climate change and, and some other issues. Going further back, I spoke to Philip Rycroft, who was a permanent secretary in the department for leaving the European Union. He was a senior official. He'd started his career working in the private office of Scotland office ministers, like Tory Scotland office ministers, who were using Scotland's brand, a relationship with the European Union, to try and sell Scotland elsewhere in the world. So we've always had that foreign policy footprint. Mm -hmm. And you see, it, you see it from the other side. So Tabo Mbeke, when he was um, president of South Africa, 
came to the Scottish Parliament to address the Scottish Parliament about education and the impact that Scotland had had on his country. You see it when I was speaking to Canadian um, members of Parliament about the impact Scotland has had in current policy on their country. So Scotland has an impact on the rest of the world. And when people say, yeah, but you're not a country or you're not a state, which, which, which I'd have some concern about, I say, well, look, here are all the examples on climate change, on international development, on our relationship with Europe, all these areas, on, and on our branding and our diaspora, where we already have a foreign policy. And then let's look at other, if you like, sub-state actors. So in Flanders, the Flemish, um, the, the, a Flemish official has exactly the same diplomatic status overseas as a Belgian official. There is no hierarchy with the Belgian government. The Danes are really interesting. In Greenland, for example, the Greenlandic government, which again is not fully independent, highly autonomous, they lead. They have direct um, engagement with the United Nations on indigenous rights, Arctic issues, issues that are important to Greenland. They're also the co-signatory. The US have a base in Tula in Greenland, and the three sign. And, and actually, the, the base became quite famous. If anybody out there has watched the film Greenland yet, yeah. it's, it's uh, the base is featured. There are three signatories on the lease to that military base. The United States, the Kingdom of Denmark and Greenland, all three have to sign it. So you see where there are areas that sub-state actors have really significant powers. And actually, one thing is the Danish government will, will look at whatever the foreign policy priorities are of the Faroe Islands and Greenland. And they also, they, they, they also concede on occasion the Greenlandic and Faroese um, priorities and foreign policy will be different from our own. And you know what? That's OK, because you have different priorities for different interests. So I look at some of these interests throughout the world, including Quebec, for instance, as a member of La Francophonie, the sort of French, um, the French organisa international organisation as its own entity um, and has been since its foundation. So there are lots of ways that you can exercise power within a devolved aspect, and that is foreign policy. Now, my opinion is it's better to be independent with a foreign ministry in the full range of powers, but if you have foreign policy, you still need to debate the powers that a Scottish Parliament have, how is it using it, and is it using those powers effectively? Let, 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 let me ask you, let me challenge some of that, just on one, one particular... Okay, fair enough. Them. Yeah. The, the, these states you've described, you know, the relationship between Belgium and Flanders, I can't speak for uh, Denmark and, and uh, the Faroes in Greenland, but I'm thinking particularly about Quebec. There is a constitutional underpinning to those arrangements. Yes. Yes. In other words, Flanders has a constitutional position and does, so does Quebec. Uh, I, I, and the relationship between those different uh, sub-states, if I could use that term, it may be the wrong terminology, is benign with, yeah. with, with the central body. That's not the case in the UK. Uh, the, the, the relationship no. between Scotland and Westminster could be described, even mildly described as malign, the very opposite. So the notion that somebody in Westminster is going to sit there quietly while Scotland develops its international contacts is a big stretch, for me anyway. What would you say to that? So it's, well, I'd say that, it's a legitimate point. And I'd say, look, I believe in independence. I believe that it makes a lot more sense. It'll be better for relationships within the United Kingdom. But let's just take the situation that we're in just now. Okay, so let's, let's say you're talking to somebody and the SNP is trying to make devolution work because you have a responsibility to, to people. Um, the problem within the UK is you set up these devolved administrations, but the, but the Westminster Parliament hold all the cards. You know, they could abolish the Scottish Parliament tomorrow, should they so wish. And the internal market legislation that was going through at Westminster saw a centralisation of that power at the first opportunity. I've quoted in the book, I go have a look at that, but, but it's an easy thing to find. I'd encourage you to look at it in the book because it gives you a perspective, but it's so easy. The Danish, um, on, on, on one of the front pages of their foreign ministry, they have a paragraph that just quotes this is these are the powers of the Faroese and Greenlandic um, administrations, and this is where we interact with them. And there is a clear setting out of who does what. 
and you just don't have that. You know, I, I, um, I, I can remember something came out recently um, during Brexit negotiations and the Daily Express was screaming that Nicola Sturgeon was undermining the UK um, negotiating position over Brexit. And I remember thinking, well, first of all, you know, the British government didn't need Nicola Sturgeon to make a mess of Brexit because they were doing that all by themselves. Um, but secondly, it is entirely legitimate for the head of the Scottish government to pursue Scotland's interests within very important negotiations like that. Now, the Canadians overcome it, rightly, you know, and, and there are weaknesses in that system. But when you're the when the trade agreement was signed between Canada and the EU, um, all of the Canadian provinces were members of the negotiating team. They all had a role to play, and they all had to sign it off. Um, Walloonie will have to sign off on the Brexit deal eventually in Belgium um, because it has a constitutional ability to do that. And that's good. And it, it, it does two things. It, it gives these parts of these countries a say in the process because it'll impact on them. The rules are clearly set out. And critically from, say, Ottawa or Copenhagen's or, or, or Brussels' perspective, um, you also have people buying into something that, that you're doing. So everybody has to share the responsibility. And I remember at the COP summit in Copenhagen, Scotland, this was in 2009, Scotland had just passed world-leading climate change legislation. And Alex Amd at the time's first minister asked to be part of the UK delegation. They said no. So instead of showing off Scotland's part of the UK, what a part of the UK was doing was, was gaining world attention at the time on it. Alex Hammond was able to turn up and do photo opportunities, take part in conferences, you know, be part of that really important fringe around COP. And um, the UK got none of the benefit of the work that Scotland had done. So, um, so I think that the fact that there are no rules just allows, um, you know, you're, as, as somebody said to me, a senior official from another government said to me, you see, the problem with the UK, and, and this, this person took no view on independence, that's up to us, but says the UK does not play the whole team in foreign affairs because it's not playing Scotland's significant global brand or even that of Wales or, or elsewhere. It, it, isn't there, yeah, I mean, that, that's fairly evident. And I assume we're going to get a repeat of that in the next big climate conference in Glasgow. I hope not, but we'll see. Well, it looks, it looks like hope. Yeah. Because the UK has already signified they want the Scottish government to take no part in it. Yeah, I mean, Boris Johnson, what was it, Claire O'Neill, who's a former Tory minister who was the chair of the organisation for a while, said she'd suggested giving Nicola Sturgeon a role. And she was quoted as saying the prime minister had, um, I quote, saltily rebutted it, whatever okay. saltily rebutting something means. I can imagine. I can imagine too. <laughs> the sort of language an old salt would use, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Seems I would to me possibly also... use that language on your show. I know. <laughs> Sometimes people use it about the show. Um, uh, we've got about five minutes to go. I, I just wanted to cover one other thing. I, I think we, we, in our foreign relations armory, I think we're missing a, a, a howitzer. Uh, and it's this. We don't have a written constitution. We can't say to the world, this is what we stand for and this is what we don't stand, we will not stand for. This seems to me to be basic, fundamental. There ought to be at least a a, a piece of paper somewhere where there is a contract between the citizens mm -hmm. and the state and between the state and other international entities, whatever form they may take. And it seems to me it, it's, a, it's a great big hole <laughs> that really needs fixing. Would you agree? I do. And, and to be fair, now this is something that's really difficult because where you have states with dreadful human rights, they're, 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 they're not going to surrender bits of that of, of, of that um, elsewhere. But where you have states with, com with commonality, the European Union has tried to do that, not always successfully. And remember, the European Union is driven by its member states. It's not driven by the institutions. The institutions are servants of the state. And really interestingly, over the years, on things like the bedroom tax or on rights around education, it's been interesting that Scottish and other citizens have been able to take the UK to the European Court of Justice to enforce their rights when the UK did not enforce their rights. Yeah. So you get an element of that with the, with the EU. And it always struck me that one of the reasons why Brexiteers didn't want um, 
to be part of the EU was they were talking about, well, the European Court of Justice can infringe our laws. No, it can't. You sign up to agreements, you keep those agreements, and if you break those agreements, then you go to court to enforce those agreements. And, oh. and, and, and I'd like to be a part of a state that doesn't break its agreements. Yeah. Well, I, I would suggest that we ought to have at least an agreement amongst ourselves as to what's important and what's not important. Uh, and I look forward to the day that Scotland has a, a written constitution that it can put before its own citizens and, and those of the world. Uh, I don't understand why we're dragging our feet on this because it seems to be elementary, but there you go. But we are, and it's a fact. Um, we're, we've almost run out of time, uh, but uh, I just want to ask you, and ask everyone this, uh, if you were to look, as the Americans say, look down the pike, mm -hmm. look down the road, and visualise Scotland, say, in three years' time, what form do you think the country will take at that time? So I can see us being an independent member state of the European Union. I think that that, and I'll, and I'll say this, I think that'll be good for Scotland, but for reasons that I think your listeners and, 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 and you will have gone through many times. But let me look outside Scotland. Why do I think it'll be so, because we've got such little time, let, let me take a slightly alternative view to this. I actually think it'll be good for the rest of Europe and for the rest of the UK. The UK has got itself into a whole, it is unique in the world in terms of not recognising the EU ambassador. It has been left in isolation. Your best friends when you're going through a time of crisis are your critical friends. Ireland has been a critical friend of the United Kingdom. I think that if we go for independence, we rejoin the European Union, we should enter into it in a spirit of generosity to our biggest neighbour to the south, and we should do all that we can to help rebuild the relationship between the UK and Brussels for what is our most important bilateral relationship with London and our most important multilateral relationship in Brussels. And I think that by acting as a bridge, it'll be good for business, good for Scotland's influence in the rest of Europe. And as a result, good for the citizens of Scotland, but good for the citizens elsewhere in these islands as well. Terrific. Thank you for that, Stephen. Um, somebody who was on the show uh, suggested that we ought to head for a, a twin state solution, i.e. two sovereign states with a, a, a treaty of cooperation uh, between the two sovereign states. How would you feel about that? Because it sounds awfully like what's that what you, what, I, what you just described. Well, look, this is about normal independence. And actually... You know, we don't have to look that far away for, for, for a similar solution. Look at the Nordic states. There you have countries like Norway, sits outside the EU, um, Sweden inside the EU, Finland inside the EU and the Euro, Greenland autonomous outside the EU, part of Denmark inside the EU. And they have their, their independence. So you can be Norwegian, you can be Nordic or Scandinavian, and you can be European as well. So Scotland can be independent inside the EU, just like Ireland. England can be outside, but we're all independent doing our own thing. And I think that's a way of building better relations across these islands. And you, you just look to our next door neighbours to see a, a good model of that in practice. And you already have, for instance, Jersey, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, who've got high degrees of autonomy as well. There you are. Excellent. You've ended up on a positive note and a succinct note as well. Well done, Steve. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you for joining us this evening. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, and thank you to all of you out there uh, watching and listening. Uh, we depend so much upon you and we're very grateful. Uh, I do hope you've enjoyed tonight. I certainly have immensely. Uh, we've got, again, a list of formidable guests and we've got a surprise next week. Uh, uh, oh, and by the way, look out for my constitutional column in the Sunday National at the weekend. And very importantly, please, support India Live. And if you're interested in what's going on, uh, obviously the TNT show uh, schedules are posted there, but go to the What's On Guide. That's www.whatsonguide.scot. It's all there, all the shows on Indie Live. And I would encourage you to support them as, as well as us. Uh, the What's On Guide is invaluable. Write it down your diary, make it, put it on your, you know, your bookmarks and, and uh, check it out regularly. You'd be astonished, literally, at the plethora of shows uh, that are available to you there. Please support them. And remember, it's been a great day for Scottish democracy. Thank you and good night all. <laughs>